December 7th, 2000, Dublin. The party season had begun and offices all over the city were celebrating Christmas and the impending end of the working year. Within hours, one young man would mysteriously vanish after a night on the town, never to be seen again. This is one of the most mysterious, unsolved cases of a missing person probably to have ever happened in this country. This situation sent shockwaves right throughout the public in Ireland because this could have been anybody's son. This is the last known footage of him making his way home close to one of Dublin's canals. Within the first couple of seconds of meeting him, I warmed to him immediately. We thought we'd find him in a day, honestly. And as it went on, it became a mystery. His inexplicable disappearance has baffled his family, his friends and law enforcement officers from all over the country. The mystery of not knowing what has happened, and that mystery continues today. Where is he? And what happened to him? There are more than 3,000 unsolved murders and thousands of missing people in the UK and Ireland. I'm criminologist Donald McIntyre, and I've put together a team of unrivaled specialist investigators to try and solve some of the most shocking and impenetrable cold cases. Hopefully, we'll bring some new information to light, which will bring some closure to the friends and family of the victims of these tragic cases. On this programme, the extraordinary disappearance of Trevor Dealey. We retrace the last hours of the popular young bank worker. We talk with people who knew and closely worked with him. And my cold case team reviews old evidence and some new thinking in an effort to discover what really happened to Trevor Dealey. Trevor Dealey literally vanished in the early hours of the morning on the 8th of December 2000 and has not been seen or heard of since. What's most unusual about this disappearance is that Trevor Dealey literally vanished in the centre of a major city late into a Thursday night and never came back. My cold case team are hoping to shed some new light on the disappearance of Trevor Dealey by re-examining the circumstances surrounding his disappearance, revisiting the places where he was last seen, and reviewing some of the witness statements of the time to see what, in the glare of the media publicity which surrounded the case, investigators might have missed. My experts have looked at and helped solve many cases over the years, and the case of Trevor Dealey, like many other unsolved cases, needs just that one piece of the jigsaw to help move the investigation forward. Even after all these years, there's always a chance that some new evidence may emerge to help solve the case once and for all. Clive Driscoll is a former Detective Chief Inspector with Scotland Yard. He's led many noted investigations over the course of his 40-year career. He has seen many cases like this one and understands its complexity. We've also enlisted the help of Dr Elizabeth Yardley. She's a criminologist and the director of the Centre for Applied Criminology at the University of Birmingham. If he had been hit by a car, the car would be damaged. There seems to be a conflict of evidence around whether he was invited or whether he wasn't invited. So that, that's interesting. It's simply just like he just disappeared. And we do have evidence of someone who's, who's gone on record as saying he didn't look drunk. We're hoping that by re-evaluating and reviewing all the evidence which has been amassed over the years, we can go some way to resolving this mystery. Trevor Dealey grew up in Nace, a commuter town on the outskirts of Dublin. His mother and father, Michael and Anne, had four children, two sons and two daughters. Trevor was one of the happiest guys you could ever meet. He's this big, 
happy smile on his face. He loved dealing with people. He was great fun, he was into sport, he was, he was into his new career. Very easy going, just relaxed. Um, nothing would seem to bother him uh, in any shape or form. He was turning out to be everything you would expect to be, a young fella becoming a young adult. A positive attitude, uh, uh, not most of the time, uh, all of the time. With no real plans after school, but with an interest in maths, Trevor opted to take a course in business at the Waterford Institute of Technology, about 100 miles from home. He didn't like the course and dropped out in his second year. He had been to Waterford to college, he'd been doing a few business courses around, and he was finding his feet. In May 1999, having taken a computer course, Trevor started work at Bank of Ireland Asset Management at its office by Leeson Street Bridge, right in the commercial heart of the city. The first time I met Trevor was when he came into the bank for an interview for a vacancy we, we had open in our IT department. And within the first couple of seconds of meeting him, I warmed to him immediately. He was into his new career. He was, he was just everything you, you would expect to be, a proper sound, level-headed guy. Very enthusiastic. Um, I, I think before the interview was over, I realised we'd found the guy we needed. In the IT department, he was a member of a team of about 10 that sat together in an open plan office. He was hardworking and had made some good friends in the office. Very personable, very helpful. And I never heard anyone uh, have a bad word to say about him. He settled in very well with the organisation. He supported about a thousand customers. He was the, the guru for email and uh, he taught me uh, what to be doing and how to do it. And this was an organisation where it was, uh, it was financial services, it was investment banking, it was high octane, fast paced. He adapted very quickly to that and the customers loved de dealing with them. In conjunction with this positive attitude to work, Trevor also knew how to let his hair down. Great crack. Um, went out quite a few times. Especially Thursday night was our night for going out, really. So if we were on the early shift, we'd finish at four and uh, we'd go for a few drinks somewhere, somewhere local. And uh, we just always had a great time. He had a great laugh, Trevor did. He moved into a nice apartment on Serpentine Avenue in the fashionable district of Sandymount. This is the apartment block where Trevor lived in the months and weeks before he disappeared. It's an unremarkable building here on the south side of Dublin. But was there anything going on inside here that could explain how a young, handsome and successful man could simply disappear without trace? Well, it appears not. The question then is, what truly lies behind his disappearance? In November 2000, Trevor took a couple of weeks off work to take a trip to Alaska. He connected with a couple of girls in Dublin and had taken the opportunity to visit them. On his return, he arrived back to his parents' house in Nace. He didn't have any steady, serious girlfriend at 19, 20 years of age. There was this one girl that I think he had a crush on um, and he may have followed her out to Alaska. I didn't. In fact, uh, I didn't know much about it at all. Um, I probably heard more after the events. He had just come back from uh, Anchorage in Alaska, and um, I was passing through home in Nace, so I just had about maybe 10 minutes with him. Personally, I don't. I think it's a complete red herring, but that's a personal opinion. And I know at the time, my two sisters thought there may have been something to it, and they thought it was important enough that it's another box to be ticked, so they, they, they took off and went over there. So I just said to him, look, Trevor, we'll have more time to talk about this at Christmas. I'm really anxious to hear all about it because it sounded very interesting. Oh, he said, listen, it was a marvellous trip. It was the trip of a lifetime. And it was one of my big regrets that we didn't have that talk at Christmas. What's your first instincts on Trevor Dealey? Well, Trevor Dealey was a young man who found his forte. Uh, he worked in IT, something he was very passionate about. He worked at, at the bank. And he had his whole life in front of him, really. Yeah, everything was going well. He seemed to be quite a jovial chap. So just your yeah, average 22-year-old guy, really. He seemed a very unlikely murder victim. 
That's just how I think pictures take a, you know, a thousand words. And if you look at the way his, his family and friends, and uh, look at that picture there, this was someone, he, he wasn't a loner, he was a very popular man. He is an unlikely person just to disappear because he seems to have an awful lot of family and friends ties here. And there's no hint of any kind of secret corner of his life that would cause him to simply vanish. The Alaska story is, is, is interesting. There seems to be a conflict of evidence around whether he was invited or whether he wasn't invited. So that, that's interesting. And whether that was a welcomed attention by the female or an unwelcomed attention by the female, which sometimes may call conflict with other boyfriends and friends. But there's nothing other that I can see that would point to why this may have happened. So why would a well-adjusted, seemingly happy young man go missing? What might be going on in his life? Could he have been persuaded not to go home, but to go somewhere else? Or could he have arranged to meet someone? And if so, did that meeting end in tragedy? Coming up, we trace Trevor's last movements. Did something happen that night that could explain his disappearance? Bank worker Trevor Dealey mysteriously disappeared while walking home to his apartment in South Dublin in the early hours of the 8th of December 2000. No trace of him has ever been found. Despite an extensive manhunt and a wide-ranging investigation, police are still no closer to establishing with any degree of certainty what happened to the 26-year-old. Now I'm hoping that by working with my team of seasoned investigators who've agreed to re-evaluate the events surrounding Trevor's disappearance, we'll be able to take a fresh look at the case, which despite the best efforts of the Irish police, has remained unsolved. The last full day Trevor was seen before his disappearance, a Thursday, he left for work and was in his office at Bank of Ireland Asset Management at the usual time. The day was significant for one main reason. The office Christmas party was to be held that night and there was a great sense of expectation as the night approached. They did their normal day's work uh, and then uh, they went out to uh, various pubs, which is the normal thing with uh, these type of parties. I know I was really looking forward to, to going out that night with all uh, my colleagues and all, just having, as everyone does on a Christmas deal, you're going to have a good time. I think I probably sent him a text and said, good luck on your night out, like, you know. The first port of call for the revellers was Copperface Jack's, a well-known bar and nightclub located on Dublin's Hartcourt Street in the heart of the city. The office dinner was held here at the Hilton Hotel, close to the Portobello Bridge, a short walk from Hartcourt Street where their pre-drinks party had been taking place. They spent quite a number of hours there, and Trevor then went to an ATM machine nearby, and he was recorded by the, the security camera withdrawing 60 pounds. Ironically, this would just be a little further along the Grand Canal, which dissects the south side of the city, where Trevor would last be seen. The night was disgusting, wet and windy, and not the kind of evening you'd be volunteering to go out but that wouldn't be a deterrent to Trevor and his mates. Everyone had a few drinks, but in fairness, nobody was inebriated or nobody couldn't function. Well, see, Trevor would have been the life and soul of a party. Everything would have been really positive and when it came to a party, it, it, that would have been just, you know, good fun. Um, work would never be an issue. Um, if he had to work um, the next morning, it would never, ever, ever be a problem. It would never stop him going out. So obviously that party was on the Thursday night and he'd work the next day, but that wouldn't interfere. After the dinner, a number of the party made their way back towards the centre of the city, towards another concentration of late night clubs for some more drinking and dancing. This is Leeson Street, situated just off St Stephen's Green in the centre of Dublin city. It's a really curious place. By day, it's a normal street of Georgian houses populated by solicitors, accountants and professions of all kinds. 
By night, it's transformed into a strip of clubs, with the basements of the buildings transformed into drinking and dancing venues, generally heaving with young people out to enjoy themselves. This one, Buck Whaley's, is where Trevor and his friends came that night. After a long night of drinking, Trevor and his workmates left Buck Whaley's at about 3.30 in the morning. Trevor left the club at 25 past three in the morning and made his way south on Leeson Street towards the bridge over the canal which leads to his office. A distance of a few hundred yards and a walk of no more than just five minutes. He arrives at the office at half past three. The question is, what happened to Trevor Dealey when he left there later that night? It's interesting, Clive. It's a Christmas party. Normally, when some, a crime happens, one anticipates it to be uh, in, on the location where the alcohol and the girls and the drink and the testosterone is there in that environment. But that wasn't the case in this. You know, he made it from the Christmas party, apparently, you know, quite successfully, to the office. Now, that is not a profile of a victim, of, a, of either somebody about to go disappear or somebody about to be murdered, perhaps. And we do have evidence of someone who's, who's gone on record as saying he didn't look drunk or, or, or excessively drunk. This doesn't strike me as, as the classic um, Christmas party where people drink too much and then do things they regret for the next year. This strikes me as someone who'd planned his exit. He'd had enough of the Christmas party. He was now going to the office where I believe he gathered some stuff up. So this isn't a drunken, let's all fall into the next nightclub. This is, this appears to be someone who'd made his d decision to leave that, to leave the Christmas party. So as he left the club, Trevor was in control of himself. The question is, did he come across someone later who was to become instrumental in his disappearance? In the aftermath of a Christmas party, there were no taxis, it was terrible weather. Do you think it's much more likely that he was the victim of, of either an accident or something much more serious? I think the accident theory is, is one theory of many, you know, that, that this was a night when the, there was a taxi strike, so there may have been more people on the road with alcohol in their blood. Maybe the, there was an accident and uh, maybe the, the, the body was concealed, but we would know, you know, somebody, that would create a, a, a chain of other people to get involved in clearing up the vehicle, disposing of a the body. There'd be too many people that would know stuff about that, and I think one of them would have come forward. Coming up, what happened to Trevor after he left the office? Did he have an unfortunate accident or did something much more sinister occur? Irish bank worker Trevor Dealey disappeared on the evening of the 8th of December 2000. His body has never been found. The last sighting of Trevor in person was in this building here, then the headquarters of Bank of Ireland Asset Management. The question is, where did he go afterwards? Our experts believe there's a real possibility of foul play, but the lack of a body and the completely cold trail from about 4 a.m. that morning has made this investigation very difficult to progress. Because of the bad quality of the footage, investigators have never been able to identify the man on the right of the picture. And I'm wondering if he'd any part to play in Trevor's subsequent disappearance. Carl Pender was working his late shift as Trevor came through the door. We have uh, batch runs to, to do and backups and that sort of thing. Uh, schedules that are run every night. So. I was doing that, keeping an eye on everything. Um, and Trevor came in, looking pretty wet, great form. Uh, asked me, was it okay to take a break, go have a tea or a coffee with him? The other thing Trevor did was to check his emails. He went over and sat down on his PC and logged on. I don't believe he sent any emails. He was more consuming emails, presumably for the, for, for the day ahead. And going back to the office so late at night, I suppose it was, it was to my mind, I think it was twofold. And part of it would have been to catch up with Carl, who was working the night shift that night, and just to fill him in about what happened and how good the night was. Trevor was very dedicated um, 
and I suppose it was just to check his emails and to see what's happening and what, what, what would his day, the next day, look like. It would have given him a temperature check. So then we just went out to the canteen and uh, had a bit of a chin wag over the night. And uh, yeah, he was just saying, great night, everyone's great spirits. We were just chatting away about the evening and uh, he was in great form. It's clear to me that while Trevor had had a few drinks, he was in no way inebriated and appeared to be well capable of conversation and was in full control of his faculties. A little bit tipsy, which you would expect, but uh, I wouldn't in any way, shape or form saying that he, he was uh, locked or drunk. At around four, Trevor told Carl he was heading home, but he, like everybody else that night, had a problem with transport. I knew there was a taxi strike on, so he had to walk home. I would have liked to have offered him a lift. Hindsight's a great thing. But, uh, yeah, it just was a case he said he was heading after we had our cup of tea and a chat, and uh, he said, I'll see you on uh, Monday. That was it, headed off. I went back to work, and that was the last I ever saw Trevor. But it wasn't the last sighting of Trevor. He'd be seen again, though not in person, but on CCTV. As Trevor left the building, he was seen again on the camera, which had captured him on the way in. Again, he was seen talking to someone. And while the footage is bad, it appears to me that this is the same man again. So who is he? And is it possible he followed Trevor after this? Even in this grainy state, this footage may hold the key to unlocking the mystery of what happened to Trevor. At around 14 minutes past four, a security camera from this building here caught him walking by in the rain, sheltering under a golf umbrella. These are those images. Where he went from here is a mystery. If Trevor was attacked or murdered, then where did his assailant take his body? The clue to his disappearance could also lie along the banks of this canal, which runs through the heart of the city. Is it possible that Trevor simply slipped and fell into the canal somewhere along this stretch of water and that his body simply was never recovered? It's the most simple theory, but I believe that what happened on CCTV after the last pictures of Trevor that night is the most significant clue to this mystery. It's this man here I believe we should be focusing on, captured on camera less than 30 seconds after Trevor. Is he the same man Trevor met outside his office minutes earlier? Was he following Trevor and is he the person behind his disappearance? It is so unusual that within, you know, a city centre, somebody can vanish simply without a trace. And when people say without a trace, it's simply just like he just disappeared. Yeah, I said the CCTV pictures going back then. I mean, and, and once again, there's a CCTV picture. You, it's an image more than a picture. It's a sort of an outline of an image. But, but yeah, to, just to completely disappear is, you know, for someone as, as obviously as um, liked as he is, 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 is unusual and makes you wonder whether the first part of that journey, he went voluntary. So he didn't go shouting and screaming because there's no evidence of that. He went voluntary with someone. So the person walking behind is of great interest, who that was. We know that he went from the party to the office and from the office he left there and we know he was caught on CCTV. Do you think that he disappeared by accident or was it by design? Was there something malevolent at play here? I would really dearly love to know who the person was he was speaking to. We know he was speaking to someone. We know possibly that someone walked behind him. Did, did they make an agreement to go somewhere, voluntary, and then that opens where, where they may have gone. We don't know, there's too many, we, we don't, there's too much we don't know to make a judgment call on what happened at the point he went missing. But I would dearly love to speak to or find that person that was walking behind him. Trevor didn't turn up for work on Friday morning, but given the night before, nobody was that concerned. About half 10, 
Uh, people were wondering where Trevor was. He hadn't turned up for work on Friday, which was deemed unusual. We kind of just figured his alarm clock hadn't gone off or, 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 or whatever. A few phone calls were made. We was, weren't getting any answer. It was after the Christmas party. Honestly, we said we'd let it slide. Uh, we'd pick it up with him uh, on the Monday morning. But as the weekend came and alarms were raised, there was still no sign of Trevor on that Monday morning. He hadn't turned up for work on Monday, which was highly unusual. So I spoke to some of his colleagues about had they been in touch with him over the weekend, and a number of them mentioned that they had been unsuccessful in trying to get in touch with him. The later it went, the more people were asking and more phone calls were made. I don't remember exactly when the guards were informed. The alarm wasn't raised with us until uh, the Monday morning. But when it was, and it was reported to Harcourt uh, Terrace Guard Station, uh, the alarm uh, bells rang straight away because it was unusual. And I think at that stage, that's when the uh, um, bank people got in touch with Mum at home. There was now serious concern for Trevor's well-being. As we've heard, he was fond of a night out, but he'd always kept in touch with friends. Even if he was out for a good night out with the lads, he was one of those people who would always turn off work the next morning. Straight away, there was an operation put in place, and a, certainly a search operation, and the detectives from all around were brought in to see could we retrace the steps and actually locate him. So as I delve deeper into this investigation, I can't help but ask myself if the extra 48 hours when the investigation was stalled would have made the difference in the hunt for Trevor Dealey. It may seem curious that it took so long for Trevor to be reported missing, but everyone just thought maybe he was suffering from a hangover or was caught up in some weekend company. Everyone just assumed he was all right. It was an assumption that was to prove tragically wrong. Coming up, the hunt for Trevor. Did the investigation suffer because it began too late? And my cold case team delivers its verdict. 22-year-old Trevor Dealey literally disappeared as he walked home in the early hours of the morning after his office Christmas party. No trace of what happened to him has emerged since. Along with my cold case team, I've been looking into the circumstances surrounding the incident. While Trevor appears to have left the party before the rest of the revellers, he did drop into his office early in the morning and was spotted on CCTV speaking to someone outside and again when he left. And most curiously, a man appears to have been walking behind him in the last piece of the CCTV which features him. Because it was the morning after the Christmas party, his co-workers thought nothing of it when he didn't arrive for work on that Friday morning. However, when he didn't arrive on Monday morning, alarm bells began to ring. But understandably, when the alarm was raised, the level of concern was intense. You get these gut instincts where you just know something is wrong, something's not right. Um, and I suppose that comes from just being out of character, like, you know. Minutes turn into hours, turn into days, turn into weeks. It's my view that the Irish authorities did everything possible to try and track Trevor down, including a detailed search of the canal and waterways close to Trevor's office. The information we were getting coming in wasn't giving us anything concrete to point us in any direction. So we had then to take the next course of action was to search the water and see was he there. I was the, in charge of the diving team at the time and to be totally honest with you, this job was a, an easy job for us. We come along here with the diving unit, we pull up here and fellas get them in dry suits. The lock is a bit deep, you search that, nothing in it. Absolutely nothing in it. And then we decide, right, if he did fall on the outside of the lock, did he get washed down? You can look for yourself here, there's not an ounce of current in that. The team even searched as far as Alexandra Basin, which leads to Dublin Bay and the Irish Sea. The basin is one of the easiest places ever to search. I've taken bodies out of the basin in my time. I took a man out of it in a car after two years. 
It's easy to search door. People say, oh, he went in there, it was never searched, it was searched. You have to understand, if a body washes in there, it'll float up. We thought that we were going to find him. I've been looking at the area where people who simply believe that Trevor had an accident say it might have happened. I've heard what the experts are saying, and I'm beginning to become sure his disappearance isn't as a result of an accident. The question is, though, was what happened a random act or something even more sinister? If he was the victim of a perpetrator, somebody who followed him, do you think this was a perpetrator who knew him or somebody who followed him because of a previous grudge in his life? Well, when we look at cases like this where you have a young man like Trevor who's come to some harm, it's normally somebody that, that's known to them, um, a friend or, or an acquaintance. So there's some link to them somewhere. But in this case, do you think that point of attack would really happen on a, on a December night, terror, that they'd follow him from the party to the office and then from the office somewhere home. Do you not think it'd be more likely that it would be a random guy, somebody trying to rob him or interact with him, ask him for a cigarette on the way home, and then it escalated from there? In my experience, it's, it's that it can, turn, it can turn very quickly. Sadly, after 34 years, I've accepted that human beings can do things which I might find, well, that's outrageous and unbelievable, but they, they manage to do them with regular monotony, really. And I think the idea of, of planning something, of planning to follow somebody, this, this kind of definition of premeditation that we have isn't the, the legal one. Uh, premeditation can be seconds, it can be minutes, it doesn't have to be hours or weeks in the build-up. So uh, if we go back to that concept of premeditation, do you think this was a, a crime which was made in moments or made in months? We simply don't know. We've got to go back to the beginning and look at everything with a fresh pair of eyes. In the days and weeks that followed, Trevor's family and friends participated in a coordinated publicity campaign to heighten awareness about the disappearance. The case even appeared as the lead story on Ireland's Crime Appeal programme. On Crimeline this month, a number of missing people, including Trevor Dealey, the 22-year-old NACE bank employee, missing in Dublin since the 8th of December. They just want answers, they want to know exactly what happened, and that's why tonight we're hoping that people here can uh, be able to help us to get information in relation to where Trevor is at this time. They were very much on the ball straight away, and you can see they were a very united family. Uh, they went out with posters, they went out with searches. Uh, one of his brothers came up and stayed in Dublin. His father took off work uh, for very, many, many months as well. But they all got together, rallied round, did exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to do something in an effort to find Trevor, and that's totally acceptable. I walked a couple of different routes, and um, I got talking to a guard who was on duty at the American Embassy. My brother went missing and he would have walked this route or this was a potential route home from. Was there any disturbance that the guards knew about or was there any incident that the guards knew about? He just said, no, but you do realise that uh, President Clinton is coming to town later on this week. And as a result, last weekend, all this route was swept by his people. They went down manholes, they were in skips, they emptied everything over the weekend. The Clinton visit would have meant the President's advance team and the local police would have undertaken a detailed search of the area. If there was anything to be found, they would have found it. There was always the possibility that Trevor might have been involved in an accident, not simply a trip into the canal, but something more serious. Is it possible that he perhaps could have been run over by somebody and then uh, somebody grabbed him, put him in the car, put him in the booth and, and then disposed of the body elsewhere? Is that a possibility? Yeah, that was one possibility that, that I was thinking about as I was looking at my, my notes for this case. But if he had been hit by a car, the car would be damaged. Somebody would have to get it repaired. They'd have to sell the car on. There'd, there'd be a chain of events that would come about as a result of that. And I think that would have unravelled by now. And um, we know that the, the industrial bins and city bins were also searched. But we know that there was a three-day delay in him going missing. And naturally, if a young man goes missing, one presumes he's disappeared with mates or he's got a girlfriend or he's gone off for partying. Um, but those three days have proved to be the key.
key handicap in this case? Yeah, those three days are massively significant because in the space of three days, witnesses' memories will deteriorate. If CCTV is in operation, it might be working on a 24-hour tape and it, it might have been recorded over. So, so much is, is lost in, in that, that first 24-hour period. The guards are as good as they, are, as they can be, in fairness to them. They're, they're, they're certainly very reactive and they're very good at being very reactive. Um, and that might sound slightly bitter. I don't mean it to sound bitter. It's in, they're, they're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place in that they will act on every bit of information that's given to them. But it's very hard for us as a family to try and expect them to create new information or to create new leads. The frustrating thing about it is for them, and especially his father, who was forefront in uh, most of the media campaigns, is that regardless of the information that we would be giving them about Trevor, we weren't giving the information that they really required is where he was, how he was, how was he safe, and would he come home. While the possibility of that is now remote, the probability that Trevor's disappearance was the result of an act of foul play is not. I agree with Clive. Trevor doesn't appear to have any difficulties on the evening of the party. I think this speaks for all our unsolved cases. The one thing is, which and we've met victims uh, in all our unsolved, and it's terribly, terribly tragic where the, these cases are not, uh, are not solved, but they really want the police in whatever jurisdiction, to go that extra mile. And when there is an absence of that, that really multiplies their kind of um, their, 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 their uh, victimology. It really, uh, really in, is. In my opinion, them. it's the least they should expect. In my opinion, I think that the uh, you know for, for police forces all around the world, they want to be judged by what they do. Uh, this is somebody who's dearly loved by many, many people. The least the police can do is show that they've done everything they can do. I mean, Liz, it does kind of multiply the pain and grief of a family if there's a sense that the police, uh, uh, you know, don't do all they can in a case like this. Absolutely, because this is your friend, this is your relative. You know, th there isn't a price that you can put on solving this case. And in a, an era of constrained resources, there are some real, real tensions there. But as I said, you can't put a price on solving a case like this. So, yeah, they should go the extra mile, absolutely. My cold case team has reviewed all the evidence and are now utterly convinced that whatever happened to Trevor Deedy that night, it could not have been accidental. So where will this case be solved, Clive? I think the witnesses, if we can trace that witness, that, that would have been the last person who spoke to him after all that. That person could have said, there's a party around the corner, do you fancy coming to it? Or I've got some drink at my home, can you, can you come around? So that person, that's where this case, I think, needs a little bit of an injection of, of, of luck, is to, to locate who that person was. He doesn't appear to have experienced any problems up to the time he left the nightclub. He encountered someone on the way into his office early on Friday morning. And encountered someone, perhaps the same person, on the way out. Then, most significantly, a man is seen only seconds behind him in the camera frames, which record the last time he was ever seen. It seems all too coincidental to me, and that man, as far as I'm concerned, is at the centre of this investigation. My cold case team and I have spent months reviewing this complex and perplexing investigation. What strikes me about it, though, is that Trevor was in pretty good shape when he left the bank in those early hours. Yes, he had a few drinks, but not enough for him to get into serious trouble. I don't believe he fell into the canal. If that had happened, his body would have surfaced by now. I believe that Trevor Dealey was a victim of circumstance. He was someone caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. He bumped into someone on his way home, perhaps got into a car and had an altercation of some description. 
The investigation is ongoing, but what happened to Trevor Dealey in the early hours of the 8th of December in the year 2000 still remains a mystery to the Irish police and the people of Ireland.